Today is Thursday, September 23rd, 2021, and the time is 9.01. The AB 3121 Task Force meeting is now called to order. Good morning, my name is Camila Moore, and I am the chair of the task force. Before we begin, let's have the staff do a roll call for attendance and establishing whether we have a quorum. Ms. Johnson, you're recognized. Good morning. Yes, Ms. Belton, would you please call the roll? Good morning, Chair Moore and members of the task force. I will now call the roll. Chair Moore. Present. Vice Chair Dr. Brown. Present. Senator Stephen Bradford. Here. Dr. Cheryl Brills. Lisa Holder. Here. Assembly Member Reginald Jones Sawyer. Dr. Javon Scott Lewis. Present. Don Tamaki. Here. Council Member Monica Montgomery Stepp. Here. There are nine task force members and the number needed for a quorum is five. There are seven task force members present. Madam Chair, a quorum has been established. Thank you, Ms. Belton. Members of the task force and members of the public, welcome to the first in the nation California Reparations Task Force September hearing whereby we will discuss in depth topics related to the transatlantic slave trade, the institution of slavery, and the impetus and implications of the great migrations. Briefly, at our July hearing, my opening remarks included a recognition of national and international developments that have direct implications to the historic work this task force is engaging in. For instance, in July, I made an acknowledgement of Juneteenth becoming a federal holiday I also referenced the UN Human Rights Chief, Michelle Bachelet, and the landmark report from the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights Office, urging countries worldwide to do more to help end discrimination, violence, and systemic racism against people of African descent and make amends to them through reparations. In the same spirit, I'd like to also acknowledge that since we last met in July, the world's largest digitized and searchable collection of Freedmen's Borough records are now um, open to the public. This will allow descendants of formerly enslaved people in the United States to trace their family histories more easily. The documents are surmised to be the first time newly freed Black people appeared in records post-emancipation in 1863. Before the Freedmen's Record Collecting, enslaved people were not included in the census and in federal documents. Congress created the Freedmen's Bureau towards the end of the American Civil War in 1865. Its goal was to assist formerly enslaved black people with several tasks, including negotiating labor contracts, legalizing marriages, and locating lost relatives. The Bureau also provided food, housing, education, and medical care to more than 4 million people before it was dismantled. A recent Harris poll surveyed by Ancestry shows that despite the enormous contributions of the organization, 72% of Americans have never heard of the Freeman's Borough. Still, it was a pivotal uh, turning point in America and continues to impact the lives of US citizens today. So for the members of the public who are watching this, um, if this applies to you, please feel free to go to Ancestry.com um, and see if any of this information relates to you and your family. In closing, I'd also like to acknowledge that the United Nations General Assembly, which is the main policy organ of the United Nations, is meeting this week. Notably, in December 2013, the UN General Assembly adopted a resolution proclaiming the years 2015 to 2024 as the International Decade for People of African Descent. The theme of the International Decade is People of African Descent, Recognition, Justice, 
and development. Notably, um, our task force is right in the middle of this decade and will conclude with our recommendations and findings right before 2024. And so what we're doing today and for the next two years is monumental and historic. And I'm looking forward to the information uh, that we'll gather and discuss uh, uh, today and tomorrow. From a review of the agenda, you can see that it is a packed agenda. So to ensure that we complete it during the time allocated, we will need to make sure that we follow the timeline established. So to help keep us on time, I'm asking everyone, including myself, to be mindful, and I will remind us as well if we start to fall behind. Uh, we anticipate a fair number of comments from members of the public, which is scheduled for one hour, beginning at 9.07 and will end at 10.07. Again, welcome, and we will now move forward to agenda item number two, public comment. I recognize Ms. Aisha. Good morning. Everyone, my name is Aisha Martin Walton. I am with the Department of Justice. We are now moving to public comment. Public comment will be for one hour, as Chair Moore indicated. Each individual is limited to three minutes for public comment. At the three minute mark, your microphone will be turned off and you will not be able to turn yourself back on. However, there is a public comment period again tomorrow at the same time and there will be seven more public meetings and we welcome everyone in the community to make comments in the future. You may also submit written comments at any time via email at reparationstaskforce at oag.ca.gov. I will now turn it over to my colleague Trini Hurtado who will explain the technical process for you. Thank you Trini. Hello, my name is Trini, and to participate in public comment, please use the raised hand function. You can find that button on the upper right hand side of the screen. On the sidebar, there is a shape of a hand. Once you click on that, it will prompt a raised hand feature. On our end, we will accept your raised hand, then you will get a notification at the top center of your screen to continue. You will have to click continue and once you are accepted and brought into the meeting as a presenter, you will be automatically muted. Once it is your turn to comment, you will be unmuted and will have three minutes to speak. At the end of your comment or at the three minute mark, you will be muted and drop back down to attendee. We will accept the raised hand feature as they come in. Once the person in front of you is done speaking, I will say your name to prompt you and you will begin speaking. Please note that there's a 20 second delay between the attendee and presenter mode, so keep that in mind as you're being promoted to presenter mode to provide public comment. I'll start. This. Very good. Hold on. It'll just be a few minutes while we get everyone over. And everyone that um, that I've checked, you need to press the continue button. Tiffany Quarles, you have three minutes. You may begin. Uh, good morning, Task Force. My name is Tiffany Quarles, and I'm with the National Assembly of American Slavery Descendants a national grassroots organization dedicated to advocating for reparations for black Americans who descend from US slavery. We sent a formal letter to you requesting that the task force send a letter directly to President Biden, requesting that he sign an executive order to establish a presidential reparations commission. NAASD has already had the opportunity to sit down with the Biden administration to request this executive order, and we would appreciate your assistance with calling on the president to move on this for the purpose of helping the African-American community. I ask today that you please grant our request. Thank you, and that concludes my comment. Tasha Henneman, you have three minutes. Good morning. Um, 
Chair Moore, Vice Chair Dr. Brown, and the task force members. My name is Dr. Tasha Henneman, and I serve as Chief of Policy and Government Affairs for PRC in San Francisco. And I also direct the Black Leadership Council, which was founded by PRC CEO, Brett Andrews. And we are a coalition of California leaders from various uh, sectors that seek to improve the conditions for our Black African-American communities. On behalf of the Black Leadership Council, I'd like to begin by thanking you all for your leadership on this issue of reparations. We fully 100% support the goals of the task force to study and develop reparation proposals for African Americans and recommend ways to educate California on your findings and recommend appropriate remedies. Black African American people have far too long been on the receiving end of criminalization, misdiagnosis, and other punitive measures that woefully miss the mark on providing appropriate cultural or trauma-informed interventions, often causing long-lasting irreparable harm. We see this happen across one's lifespan and even beginning in utero, not having access to quality, culturally appropriate health care. I know I'm preaching to the choir here, but while some policy improvements have led the way to addressing the many disparities that Blacks and African American individuals face in their daily lives, there's still a long way to go as we seek to apply equity and parity across all communities, ultimately creating a more just society. The Black Leadership Council seeks to be a catalyst to improve conditions for Black African American populations across the San Francisco Bay Area and California. We are a community convener and coalition that has uh, serves over 500,000 clients per year across a myriad of service modalities. So now is the time for sweeping policies that address the historical legacy of slavery and systemic racism. And we believe that establishing racial equality isn't just about creating diversity, it's about taking intentional action to create equal opportunity for everyone to access quality education, healthcare, wealth, and housing, and, many, and much more. To this end, the Black Leadership Council is mobilized to support and develop a sweeping collection of policies to advance our Black prosperity agenda that addresses comprehensive reforms to the state's healthcare, economic, housing, and education systems, and drive racialized inequalities amongst Black and other low-income Californians, including government-inflicted death. So we are pleased um, with your work. We are here to partner with you. Our, our request is that we can help you spread your message of reform. Um, and we look forward to partnering with the task force uh, and uh, really look forward to your recommendations that will support black communities, help us thrive and enact meaningful change for our communities. Thank you so much for your time and again, for your leadership. Thank you. Friday Jones, you're up. You've been unmuted, you have three minutes. Okay, great. Good morning, task force members. Uh, my name is Consa Jones Muhammad. I'm a city commissioner for Mayor Garcetti's Los Angeles Reparations Task Force. I am a co-chair for the National Assembly of American Slavery Descendants and the Los Angeles chapter. And our local chapter is a member of the Coalition for a Just and Equitable California. Uh, as a state body with the sixth largest economy in the world, it is through the resources of the many state departments and the state budget where the task force has the ability to create and repair our society and the standing of the descendant community within it. Um, there is an opportunity to create a wide variety of benefits in addition to compensation for generations to come. The creation of whiteness and the dehumanization of blackness has cost this nation its humanity and greater GDP by stifling ingenuity and economic growth. The truth in reconciliation taking place tomorrow is an important part of the repair process. This task force must consider the wealth inequity created by racism and the loss of revenues to the state. Plessy versus Ferguson in 1896 required whiteness and naturalization law. If you were not white, you were not a US citizen. And if you were not a citizen, you had no political voice. Today, I'm here to exercise my voice. The Coalition for Just and Equitable California has been steadfast in vocalizing our desire for a strong community engagement plan. I'm thankful to Tammy Mack and Stevie Wonder for allowing me on KJLH Radio and Dominique Suprema and Tavis Smiley of KBLA Radio to publicize this month's hearing dates and the subject matter on today's agenda. 
NAASD Los Angeles has drafted proposals to the city council members for discretionary funds to be allocated for marketing campaigns for future hearings. We are grassroots advocates willing to think outside the box to increase in community engagement, but this body has to expeditiously initiate a plan uh, so as to not politically disenfranchise the beneficiary community through this process. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, this morning. I appreciate what you all are doing. Have a great day. Thank you. Sharice Cryer, you have three minutes. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Sharice Cryer. I'm a direct descendant of American slavery on both paternal and maternal side and a second generation Angelino. In August, Leonard Letton, a Jamaican national of Brooklyn, New York, was sentenced by the U.S. attorney for a lottery scam. In Dr. Devon Scott Lewis's book, Scammers Yard, it is alluded that such scams are a form of reparations. I have two questions for the commission today. One, can the commission clarify if it sees this activity as a form of reparations? And two, can you please confirm whether the commission is advocating for other descendants of slavery living in the U.S., i.e. non-descendants of American slavery, to be awarded reparations in California? For example, I cannot make a claim to CARICOM for reparations. Those are my questions. Thank you so much. Thank you. Simon View, you have three minutes. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yes. <laughs> thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Simon Vu. Uh, thank you to the chair and task force members for the opportunity to provide comments. Uh, Simon Vu on behalf of, the, of CBHA, the California Council of Community Behavioral Health Agencies. CBHA is a statewide association of mental health and system use disorder nonprofit community agencies that provide behavioral health services to nearly 800,000 Californians. At CBHA, we recognize the impact of health disparities on the communities our member agencies serve, and particularly, in particular, communities of color continue to suffer from behavioral health conditions at disproportional rates when compared to their white counterparts. A study shows that black Americans are 20% more likely to experience serious psychological distress than the general population. In addition, black adults are more likely to report feelings of sadness and hopelessness than white adults, but less than 9% of black adults receive mental health services compared to 18% of white adults. For communities of color in America, particularly the black community, the psychological impact of discrimination, racism, and historical trauma is severe, which exacerbates stigma, which in turn impacts their willing treatment. A CBHA is exploring ways to address these inequalities through our race and social equity task force. We continue to advocate with our partners in behavioral health to address uh, the racial pandemic in our state and country. And uh, we are very pleased with the real work and stand ready to support the task force and provide any assistance and information to further the mission and goals of the task force. Last month, we sent out an introduction letter mm -hmm. to the task force, and we're uh, happy to follow up. And thank you so much for your time and leadership. Thank you very much. Does anyone else wish to make public comment? Please use the raised hand feature. Ms. Martin Walton, I would like to interject to briefly recognize member Grills and member Joan Sawyer. Please Welcome. Do. Yes, um, that is all. We can re resume with public comment. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to make a public comment today? Trini, do we have anyone else in the queue? No. Okay. It is now 
921. And Chair Moore, we can, uh, to your pleasure, we can wait a couple more minutes or we can turn it back over to you to uh, continue the meeting. You please unmute yourself. I'm wondering, is it possible to reserve, we can do this potentially through a, a motion, reserve the balance of the time for public comment towards the afternoon um, to give people another chance to comment? I um, don't know if that is an option. Or we, we can wait a few minutes. I, I don't want to cut off Yes, Madam time. Chair. Yes, Madam you are Chair, waiting this now. Is Yes, Ms. Johnson, Johnson, you are Thank you. You cannot change the time of the public comment because it's been noticed okay. for this time period. So you need to keep it at this time. You can uh, wait until that time elapses, and that would be the best thing that you do because you've got it for a block of time yes. on the agenda. So you need to adhere to that. Thank you. Uh, Thank I, you, Paula Johnson. Yes. Go ahead, M Member Holder. Here. Thank you. Um, good morning, everyone. I have a, a, a point of clarification about this public time slot um, and a suggestion. I'm, I'm wondering whether we can, as a task force, resume the agenda and get started during this time slot, but also um, allow public comment to continue until 10 o'clock. So, if we are in the middle of a conversation, um, we can we can end the conversation or table it until the speaker, the public commentary, goes forward, um, and then and then resume. Uh, there is actually another person that would like to speak. I'll go ahead and promote him right now. Okay. Your name, please. Hold on, just a second. Okay, Trini. Very good. Darius Young, you have three minutes. Yes, my name is um, Darius Young, and I represent the Bay Area Health Inequity Initiative, also known as Bar High, and we are the membership body of the 11 Bay Area Health Departments. And we came together in May and we convened a group of 35 African-American led organizations to come up with a black housing strategy within the Bay Area region, effectively known as Black Hat. And so um, while I recognize that reparations covers a, a wide range of remedies that we need to seek and that we need to, to, to address at this time, we also would like to highly, highly put on the radar that, you know, we know that housing is one of the worst forms of um, discrimination that we have had in this country. And um, we also know that when it comes to the health disparities, those things that drive the inequities within our um, health, things that happen outside of the doc doctor's office, they are related to housing. And it was ever so present when we looked at um, when the veil was lifted off of the inequities and all the things that we did during this COVID-19 pandemic. With that said, um, we hope that um, Bar High, as well as the Black Housing Advisory Task Force, will be able to work together with you on remedies to our housing situation and all the other things that have helped to impact, that has impacted our African-American-led population and has led to inequities over incarceration, over policing, all those things in our communities that have brought us to a point to where the equity is not the same for everybody else. And as we address these issues today and look forward to reparations being enacted, we also would like to hold um, right now that there is that 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 there are ways right now that we could address some of the things starting now in um housing, and that's to look at policies and the monies that have already come down through the ARPA funding, um, the historic state um, surplus and the other dollars that should be coming down soon from the um, infrastructure <clears throat> plan. So we look forward to, to working with you along with the task force 
and we hope that you will give us your time. And we know that you will do a good job. And I really would like to thank Camilla because she did address our group, um, a, I think it was back in May. So thank you and we appreciate you. And we look forward to, to making this, um, what, what we are owed come to reality. Thank you. Are there any other speakers? There are no other speakers at this time. Okay, so we can uh, move on with the agenda recognizing member holder suggestion. So in the event that members of the public would like to address the task force members between now and 10.07, you can call between that time frame, and we will uh, stop our agenda uh, to recognize the public comment. So now we will move to agenda action item number, th number three, which is the approval of the minutes. So the minutes from the July uh, 9 task force meeting were sent to task force members with the materials, and we've all had a chance to review them. So at this time, I would like to ask Task Force members, if there are any questions, comments, or corrections regarding the minutes. Member Joan Sawyer, you are recognized. Madam Chair, I would like to move the approval of the minutes. Is there a second? Oh. You can still ask questions. Just wanted to move the agenda along. Are there any questions related to the minutes? Okay, so there's a motion on the floor by member Joan Sawyer to accept the, meet, the minutes as presented. Is there a second to the motion? I second, this is Cheryl Grills. So member Grills seconds the motion. So it has been moved and seconded to adopt the minutes as presented. Is there any discussion? Okay. Hearing no discussion, we will vote and we will vote by roll call. I will call on Parliamentarian Johnson who will recognize Ms. Belton who will then conduct the roll call. Parliamentarian yes. Johnson, you are recognized. Thank you. Ms. Belton, please call the roll and record the vote. Thank you. Chair Moore, your vote, please. Aye. Chair Moore votes aye. Vice Chair Dr. Brown. Aye. Vice Chair Senator Stephen Bradford. Aye. Senator Stephen Bradford votes aye. Dr. Cheryl Grills. Aye. Dr. Cheryl Grills votes aye. Lisa Holder. Aye. Lisa Holder votes aye. Assemblymember Reginald Joan Sawyer. Aye. Assemblymember Reginald Joan Sawyer votes aye. Dr. Javon Scott Lewis. Aye. Dr. Javon Scott Lewis votes aye. Don Tamaki. Aye. Don Tamaki votes aye. Councilmember Monica Montgomery Step. Aye. Councilmember Monica Montgomery Step votes aye. Madam Chair, on the motion, there were nine yay votes, no nay votes, and no abstentions. Thank you, Ms. Excuse Belton. Oh, excuse me. We have another speaker, another commenter. Okay, one moment. Thank Ms. Belton, thank you. The vote was nine yeas and zero nays. The ayes have it and the motion carries. The minutes are approved as presented. I will now move to Trini Hurtado and uh, Ms. Aisha um, Martin Walton to recognize a member of the public. Thank you.
Carl T, you need to uh, click on the continue button so I can move you over, please. Carl T, you have three minutes. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we can hear you. Member of Allen Temple and the Public Ministry, and we are very interested in educating our community about reparations. And to that end, we have already had a virtual town hall, which, in addition to reflecting on the last election. Um, we also discussed in detail reparations with Dr. Shirley Weber, who was quite informative, and we definitely appreciate. So one of my questions is, as a member of a community organization, how can we best um, educate the community? We would like to have several more town halls and are wondering if any of the commission will be willing or interested in participating, and how can we make that happen? After such a long time, I think this is such an important step in our history that we really, really want to educate as many people as we can. So that is just my request and my appreciation, and thanks for you all being on this commission. I know it's long and arduous task, but I just want you to know that there are people out here that want to definitely resoundingly spread this information and educate our community so that we can be, you know, on task with whatever the commission suggests and move this very important um, issue forward. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Are there any other speakers in the queue for now? No, at this time, no. Okay. So at this moment, we will move to agenda item number four, further consideration of community engagement. Again, to the members of the public, um, if you would like to call in uh, for public comment between now um, and, and 10.07, you can do that. Uh, we will continue to go on with our agenda and we will pause to recognize uh, members of the public in the event that they have any public comment to share with us. So now we will discuss agenda item number four, further consideration of community engagement. So at our last hearing, uh, we had an open discussion about our community engagement plan. Uh, since we last met, uh, task force members were sent a draft scope of work uh, uh, from the UCLA Bunch Center um, and it included, among other materials, um, that member show grills uh, will share with us. So at this time, I would like to recognize member grills, who will give us an update um, and introduce um, Professor Michael Stoll. Member Thank grills, you are recognized. Thank you very much. Um, so I'd like to start with providing um, everyone with an overview of where we have grown and moved since our last meeting. Uh, I'm going to share my screen. However, uh, share screen, this one, okay. Can everyone see my screen okay? Yes. Okay, thank you. So I'm sharing with you now an update on where we are at with the California Reparations Task Force. Um, in terms of the community engagement strategy. Um, first, I wanted to note that we are operating within, and we're mindful of the fact that we're operating within a very broad socio-ecological landscape. At the heart of our focus, of course, is African-American descendants of enslaved Africans. Um, but this um, is a, a reality that exists within a broader scope, which is um, we coexist with people of African ancestry in the state um, as well as in the country. There, is, there are reparations activities happening um, across the state uh, in different counties and cities, and there is a national landscape of activity happening uh, around reparations. In addition to that, there's the international landscape. Why do I share all of this? Because there are intersecting sources of information that may emerge in the um, community engagement process. 
In terms of the listening sessions, we are targeting about 12 listening sessions um, that will be um, kind of um, spearheaded by a series of anchor organizations that will um, lead the community engagement process because of their understanding of and their networks uh, in the state, uh, understanding the needs and the issues and concerns of Black constituents. Um, we want to make sure that this um, communications uh, messaging and marketing strategy is a, an integral part of the community engagement process, and I'll say more about that um, in a moment. And we'll have our anchor organizations joined by what I'm calling tier two local organizations who are actually essentially um, on the ground, boots on the ground, uh, connected to various constituency groups, able to mobilize um, um, members of their constituents and bring them to the listening sessions. So how the process works is pretty similar to what I described before which is that we would have these series of anchor organizations who have vast networks um, and a presence in the state uh, around the um, Black agenda issues, uh, and that we will then move to connect those anchor organizations with a tier two local organization or series of them to make sure that there was a nuanced understanding of the needs of the folks in that regard. Um, and then we have um, different areas of foci um, but essentially how the process will work is that the uh, anchor organizations will provide information to a communications entity to, to provide education in advance of any listening session so that there's a shared level of understanding about what the task force's uh, mission is um, and then to give baseline basic information from different perspectives about what is reparations what are the harms that have been done? And then from there, get the input of the community that will then be uh, directed back to the task force via summaries and analyses by the Ralph Bunch Center, which would be hosting the anchor organizations and the logistics processes involved in community engagement. So the different areas of foci, these are again examples or samples um, they would be finalized through the input of the anchor organizations and the tier two local organizations, but could be regional focused listening sessions, uh, listening sessions for folks who are systems involved, um, definitely listening sessions that are focused on the needs of black farmers, uh, economics, housing, employment, et cetera. Again, the, the community engagement process will walk hand in hand with a communication strategy. Um, uh, the Bunch Center will be entertaining um, options for firms that would be able to provide a robust communication strategy that um, would be uh, informed by the anchor organizations and the tier two organizations that will use a multi-pronged approach to community um, communications and mar um, almost marketing and branding, if you will, of the task force and its mission, uh, and uh, ensuring that we are tracking our uh, community um, uh, sentiment and feedback. So in terms of a timeline, what we're looking at is about a one year process, beginning in October with um, all of the anchor organizations selected by the Bunch Center. Um, the communications firm would be selected um, in October by the Bunch Center. The anchor organizations would start meeting in November um, and, and they would select the tier two organizations. Uh, we would like to pilot a, a listening session with a group of college students that would be held virtually. That is in the planning stages. Um, and then there would be communications and messaging beginning in January and listening sessions beginning in January of 2022. Sorry, that's a typo. And then from there, we would conduct those um, 12 listening sessions uh, over the course of the remaining months with a conclusion in September of 2022. And I do know that we have a report that would be coming out somewhere in, during that process, I believe around June, and the findings to date can be shared uh, in advance for that particular meeting. So the final, comments that I want to share is that our time frame is about a one-year process 
12 listening sessions and the Bunch, Ralph Bunch Center would be um, providing a number of services, including selection and launch of the communications firm and strategy, the anchor organizations and the tier two local community-based organizations with input from the anchor organizations. Um, managing the listening session logistics, the who, what, when, where, um, and then also documenting, analyzing, and extracting themes from the listening sessions and um, providing um, data from listening session surveys that they will um, provide. So that is a quick overview. I'd like to now actually um, introduce um, Dr. Michael Stoll, who is a professor of public policy in the Luskin School of Public Affairs at UCLA. Uh, Dr. Stoll's published work explores questions of poverty, labor markets, migration, and crime. Uh, in 2007, the state of California's Legislative Black Caucus sponsored a report on the status of Black Californians, and Professor Stoll was one of the principal investigators of that report. Uh, much of his work has been featured in a variety of media outlets, and he also regularly advises the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services and Labor, as well as state and local governments in various capacities. Uh, Dr. Stoll received his Ph.D. from MIT and a bachelor's degree from UC Berkeley. Dr. Stoll, would you like to share uh, with the task force your thoughts on the, communicate, the community engagement process? Good, Madam Chair. I have a procedure question. Oh, sorry. Vice Chair Brown, you are recognized. At what point will the task force be able to be engaged in sharing questions or comments regarding this presentation? Uh, Vice Chair Brown, we will um, take questions from task force members after Professor Stoll uh, gives his statement. Very good. All right. Thank you for the question. Um, Professor Stoll, Madam are Chair? you? Okay. Who is that? Point of Ms. Order. Belton? Yes. Thank You're you, right Madam now. Chair. Because the task force is running early, we actually do not have Professor Stoll yet. Uh, okay. We have prepared him for this possibility, but not this early. Um, right. And so I would suggest that the task force might want to direct questions to uh, member grills where appropriate, and we will certainly uh, mm -hmm. unmute uh, Professor Stoll as soon as he's available. Okay, thank you, Ms. Bolton. Uh, so again, I just want to do a brief uh, a reminder to members of the public, public comment period is still open. So if you have um, any public comment, you can uh, call between now um, and 10.07, and we will recognize you. In the meantime, uh, we will uh, turn back to agenda item four, further consideration of community engagement plan, um, and we will now take questions uh, from the task force. But before I take any questions from the task force, I want to recognize member girls again. Do you have any other comments? Yes, do you have any other comments? Uh, no, I think the things that um, Dr. Stoll was going to speak to, the members of the task force already have in the scope of work that he uh, submitted uh, prior to this meeting. Uh, Madam Chair. I sure brought you are recognized. As it regards to the overall presentation by Dr. Grills, um, maybe it was mentioned and I didn't get it, but in terms of the involvement of stakeholders, I noticed black farmers were there, uh, but I did not see black educators. I did not see black civil rights advocates, and particularly the National Association for the Advancement of Color People. And the Black Church, which has been back to our enslavement, our bastion, our high tower of hope. We have to, in my estimation, 
engage those significant entities in any community engagement. Thank you, Dr. Brown. Um, on my slide, it listed that this was a sample. I did not try to provide an exhaustive list of what the different constituent groups would and consist of. And absolutely all of the groups that you mentioned um, would definitely be invited. The, 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 the challenge or the task, I'll put it that way, at hand is to figure out how within the context of 12 listening sessions to best organize things so that all of those different voices are heard. So for example, there might be a statewide listening session specifically geared toward the Black church, um, toward Black civil rights um, um, matters, et cetera. Uh, there may be regional focus um, uh, listening sessions that would then be able to bring in you know, education or whatever the case might be. So that was not an exhaustive list. That was not the final list. That was just to give you some examples of what the different constituent groups would be. Okay, I have a question, um, and it, it's related to uh, the organizations who may or may not be involved in this process. So from, the, from my understanding of your comments, uh, Member Grills, you stated that the Bunch Center would be the ones to select the anchor organizations and the tier two organizations. Um, and I'm sure we can talk about this more in depth, maybe when Stoll comes, Professor Stoll is present, but you know, I'm, I'm, I'm curious. Here. Oh, okay. Hi, Professor Stoll, how are you? Oh, I'm um, great. Let me just try to get my video working. Okay, while you get your video together, I do see that there is um, someone who wants to give public comment. Uh, we are still in the public comment period. Um, um, so at this moment, I would like to go to uh, Ms. Hurtado and Ms. Uh, Marie Walton. Um, is there someone, um, a member of the public who is ready to speak at this time? Yes, Marjorie L. Melvin. You have three minutes. Good, good morning. Um, can you hear me? If you can just yes. thumb up, great. Um, my name is Marjorie Melvin. I was born and raised in Southern California. I'm a lifetime member of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated, Pomona Valley Alumni Chapter. I'm also a fourth generation African Methodist Episcopal uh, member. I am a member of Prim Tabernacle AME Church here in the city of Pomona. I am a lifetime member of the National Council of Negro Women and a parent and teacher with the California African American Parents of Diamond Bar. My question to the task force is uh, related to the organizations involved in, in shaping um, the uh, framework surrounding the reparations program. And so I would like to know why specifically UCLA Bunch Center was chosen as the center organization to assist with shaping policy surrounding reparations. And my request would be to have the Coalition for a Just and Equitable <clears throat> California be considered as either the center organization and or the um, anchor organization, one of the anchor organizations surrounding the framework for shaping uh, reparations in California. Having been a prison advocate, advocate or an advocate against um, over incarceration, I think it's very important to have folks who are actually doing the work, actively engaged, mm -hmm. and have brought reparations to the forefront uh, to be involved in this, uh, this, this movement. And those are my comments. And again, my name is Marjorie Melvin. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comment. There are no other commenters at this time. Thank you, Ms. Hurtado. Uh, bef uh, now we will go to Professor Stolb. Again, brief reminder. Uh, we are in the public comment period, so between now and 10.07, members of the public can 
continue to uh, make public comment and we will see the agenda to recognize members of the public. Um, just also as a reminder on the agenda, uh, this action, sorry, this agenda item number four, further consideration of community engagement plan uh, was planned to be for 10, 10 a.m. and 10, 45 a.m. So we are vastly ahead of schedule. Um, but again, if you, if members of the public would like to speak, you have between now and 10.07 to do so. Um, now I will go back to uh, and recognize uh, Professor Stoltz. Welcome and uh, glad to see you. Thank Here. you, sorry. Uh, I'm glad the meeting is moving uh, faster than, uh, than on the agenda and I am had to be in transition for a family matter. So that's why you see my background the way that it is. But let me state that um, first and foremost, uh, thank you for inviting me to, 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 to be here. Um, and let me state uh, that the Bunch Center's role is simply to be supportive. Uh, we do not consider ourselves a policy development body um, in this project. Our job, as we see it, is to support the efforts of the task force to, to be objective of observers and trained analysts to report back what we find from the convenings as as well as as you see what uh, Dr. Grills had proposed um, or spoke about that I had proposed the development of methods and tools to assess the the, the sentiments of the general public around the issues that are brought forward by the task force and that bubble up from the convenings, as well as uh, the ability to synthesize in an objective way uh, what is discussed and found. We do not see ourselves as a body that proposes policy or that influences the ideas of the task force uh, or to shape public opinion. Our job as analysts is simply to use our skills at, uh, at analysis and summary to as best as we can, comprehensively, analytically, and categorically report back what is being discussed and found. So for example, one idea that I had proposed is that in addition to the general public comments that will come through the convenings, that we would in consultation with the anchor organizations develop a survey that we could administer uh, to either uh, convening participants to some broader population defined um, in conjunction with the anchor organizations or with the task force uh, to get overall central tendency of opinions and preferences of those who are involved in this deliberative body. And, our, our, and what we do, because we're trained analysts, is to summarize that in a way that uh, doesn't reflect our opinions or our positions, but the positions that have been expressed through the convenings. And we will do so by also recording them using qualitative techniques to analyze categories that emerge and how frequently they emerge, as well as to administer a survey that will be deliberate that will be deliberately developed between Bunch and the anchor organizations and whoever the task force believes be involved in that. Uh, we would administer that survey and to analyze the results and to provide a report back to uh, the task force on, on the evidence that we collect and present. We, we again, um, offer no policy positions uh, other than to be supportive in, in, the, in the task force process. Um, Madam Chair. Is there is there any is there I mean I would love to be able to discuss this if there are questions or if there are other uh, issues agenda items that were expressed related to the potential role of bunch that I may have missed since since I, I came in um, it seems during the middle of the discussion around this this topic. Um. Vice Chair Brown, you're recognized. I believe you may have a question. Right? Um, Dr. Stoll, uh, good morning. Good morning, uh, this, Dr. Brown. This is an oversight, I'm, I'm, I'm sure, but I think we should underscore it. When we talk about developing a universe for this engagement, 
in the presentation that was earlier represented by Dr. Grills, I found it uh, of concern to me personally that the black church of the black faith community was not listed. And number two, education is very much so important. Black educators, their organizations such as the Alliance of Black School Educators, we should be included in this base. And then you have black psychologists. Uh, so I'm hoping that the thought is that we must be inclusive of those who've been out there in the field, in the trenches, and have much to show in terms of dealing with this evil of enslavement, discrimination, and dehumanization of black folk. Dr. Brown, this is Dr. Grills again. Um, since you named me in your comments and you expressed concerns, let me reiterate that what was in that slide were merely samples of anchor organizations and not even names were anchor organizations, but samples of foci for the listening sessions. And that was not meant to be considered an exhaustive list. Let me also speak to something that uh, Chair Moore was, I believe, beginning to ask a question about. Um, with these anchor organizations, the point of, of the anchor organizations and, and which organizations would be selected is expressly around the, the goal of reach and inclusion. An anchor organization would be, the criteria for an anchor organization is that they are part of a large network that could expand and make sure that as much coverage as possible is occurring in who is touched by the outreach for participation in the listening sessions. Secondly, when we look at some of the anchor organizations that may be under consideration right now, um, they in fact speak to exactly what you're hoping to be represented. For example, one of the organizations um, that may be under consideration um, is a coalition um, led by an inclusion, including congregations, black clergy, a coalition of black clergy and faith-based organizations in one region of California. Another um, uh, potential anchor organization is focused on social justice organization that has a network of over 20, 24 black led organizations focused on a variety of social justice issues. Another potential anchor organization is focused on um, um, uh, the whole issue around um, census and redistricting and has an extensive network across the state that's multi-issue. Um, so again, the point is really about reach and inclusion, not about exclusion. Right. Okay, Michael, one more, oh, Vice Chair Brown. I want to recognize the members of the public because the public comment period is still open. We have uh, less than uh, 10 minutes actually, it closes at 10.07. There's a couple of members of the public who are waiting to speak. I hate to interject during this robust discussion, but let's uh, acknowledge the members of the public at this time. Ms. Hurtado and Ms. Marie Walton. Yes, Chair Moore and members, there are three people in the queue, and these are the last three people that we can take public comments at, from. Thank you. Rini? Um, Nanzinga? You are now unmuted and you have three minutes to speak. Go ahead. Okay, I'm gonna move to the next speaker. We'll try and get your sound worked out.
Angela Nerva, you have been unmuted and you have three minutes to speak. Thank you. My name is Angela Nirvana. I want to thank each of you here on the task force uh, for investing all of your time, energy into ensuring that um, uh, Black American descendants of U.S. chattel slavery are repaired. I want to speak about how immigration is being weaponized against us to keep us tethered to the bottom as the permanent anchor of this country's capitalism. That includes California. We have gone from 16% to less than 5% since COVID. We are dying disproportionately, not necessarily because of the COVID, but because of medical bias. We are last in every metric as this country opens its borders to more refugees and immigrants while whipping on the black ones, the Haitians. Anti-Black racism is in full effect and has been for 400 years since we were brought here in chains, while Biden gives protections to Asians. And the cry that we don't have the trillions over multi-generations to repair Black American descendants of U.S. chattel slavery is a farce. Our reparations are being given away to corporations and immigrants while we are being discriminated against in hiring practices, we have no social capital at the hiring tables. Unemployment is gone now and eviction moratoriums are being lifted all over the country while the president mandates vaccines, which we know we as black American descendants of US chattel slavery do not trust this government and what they've done to our people and continue to do to our people. Like I said, this isn't just a federal problem. This is California too. A 2018 overview of national median incomes show Nigerians at 62,000, <clears throat> Haitians at 53,8, and Black American descendants of US chattel slavery at 41,000. Today, we are at $30,134 in median national income with a national median home price of $379,000. <laughs> I implore upon the task force to bear all of this in mind as you draft proposals to repair black American descendants of US chattel slavery, whose ancestors built this country with their lives and ultimately the wealth that everyone eats from but us. Thank you for allowing me to share. Thank you for your comment. Um, Next speaker. Chris L. You are unmuted. You may now speak. Hey, thanks for hearing me. Thanks for all of your work. Good to see everybody today. Happy Thursday. Uh, and thanks for spending all day uh, today and tomorrow doing this important work. I actually want to talk a little bit about uh, community engagement and the. Uh, I just have to be honest. I came in kind of late, so I didn't. I don't have the benefit, the full benefit of Dr. Grills' plan uh, to re to re review yet. Uh, but I do want to talk a little bit about um, community engagement uh, and outreach more broadly, and just give you some examples of my own sort of experience and work working as you most of you know with the coalition for just and equitable california cjec um, and working to raise awareness and do community engagement around what you are doing right now right so uh again i don't have the benefit of, doc of dr girl's plan but i do want to to suggest and and put on your spirits and put on your radars that a lot of times when we do community engagement, when governments and government bodies do community engagement, it's focused around groups, right? It's very focused around groups that, you know, we lean on very heavily, right, to, to you know, perform a lot of the outreach on behalf of the, the, the body itself. And that's good, but I want us to also think more broadly about community engagement and actually a more direct approach and actually going to people themselves too, right? I, I wouldn't just rely on actually group based community outreach. Uh, I would also do uh, and find ways to do and support direct contact to 
black folks in California because quite honestly, not everybody that we need to, t to talk to is going to be touched by these groups. Um, uh, and, and that's just a fact of the reality of black life now, right? We are in many ways disconnected from even the groups and organizations that are here to do us well. So uh, let's think more, more broadly about that. Uh, I hope that is in, included and, and there's space to have that included in Dr. Girls' framework. Um, I also want to plug here the Coalition for Just and Equitable California as one of the organizations that I think should be at, should be at the top of the list priority-wise for doing a lot of this work. We are already doing a tremendous amount of work. We've already done a tremendous amount of work. We will continue to do it because this is our lives uh, and we're here to the to the end. Uh, but uh, uh, just want to put us uh, on the on your radar if we're not already. And also the National Assembly of American Slavery Descendants, which is a really awesome national organization that's doing a lot of great rep reparations related work. Also, um, we're regular black folks, we're regular community members, and we're here to engage and to help and support this process to reach the rest of us. Okay, because every single one of us is going to be have to be have to be a part of this. Thank you much. I will yield the balance of my time. Have a great day. Thank you, Chris. We are close to the end of our one hour limit for public comments. So the next person will be our last speaker. Trini. OK, we're going to try this again. I've chatted with him. We'll see if he can if we can hear him this time. Nzinga. You have three minutes. You are our last speaker. Someone else in the queue that's not in Zynga that could potentially take their place? Uh, yes, there are uh, three people in the queue. We should recognize them. Would you like to recognize all three or just the next one? All three. Yes, all three. And then we'll close it. Thank you so much. Marcus Champion, you have three minutes. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Marcus Champion. I am a uh, California native, uh, born and raised in Inglewood, also a member of the Coalition for a Just and Equitable California, as well as the National Assembly of American Slavery Descendants Los Angeles, AASDLA. And uh, I would like to recommend both those orgs and suggest both those organizations, CJAC, as well as NAASDLA, as anchor orgs for the community outreach. And similar to what uh, my brother Chris Lachin said before me, uh, I think it's imperative that the public is directly engaged. And also if the task force as well as the Department of Justice can make that a imperative priority to engage the public, because in doing our due diligence and doing our work, we recognize that when it comes to knowledge of this task force, when it comes to knowledge of the work that's happening right now in this important, very important reparations work, uh, our greater uh, black community within the state is not aware of what's going on. And that makes it very hard to get the work done when the people don't know what's actually happening. So again, I would like to recommend CJEC as well as NAASD Los Angeles as anchor orgs to help advance this work. And I wanna thank you all for the work you've done and continue to do. Thank you for your comment. Cash gains. You now have three minutes. Uh, mic check. What's good, y'all? Uh, yes, I'm Black American on both. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah, uh, I'm both. I'm Black American on both sides. Just for context. Um, first, I wanted to say um, thank you guys for the work you're doing. Uh, reparations is very important to us in modern day. Uh, many people in my generation have become disillusioned with uh, the voting process. Um, I mean, I'm not going to belabor the room, but um, again, direct cash payments is something that I've, I've been, been very uh, focused on myself in studying reparations, as well as the 40 acres claim. Uh, that was going to be my just uh, kind of question for the room or something to, to marinate on. Um, as California is one of the richest states uh, in America and comparable economically to some countries, I'm sure it's already been mentioned before, 
um, it's a shining beacon uh, um, for setting a high uh, uh, ceiling for what reparations could look like. Um, so just keeping that in mind, I hope that that's well understood. Um, what are y'all's thoughts on trying to connect our reparative justice to so-called uh, influencers uh, of our time and specifically to Silicon Valley as well, and in a way even the black church. And that's by having a 40 acres and a Tesla claim, essentially an update to the mule where uh, uh, Elon Musk would have to argue why he wouldn't uh, uh, fulfill a claim for 38 million cars for black Americans. Uh, in my understanding, Gavin Newsom trying to move California off of being on gasoline cars anyway. So uh, uh, just something uh, to keep in mind that we are very, very interested in not just the direct cash payments as reparationists, but in our land and trying to connect it to something sexy for the next generation. Uh, um, and again, this connects to the black church as was mentioned earlier, because it was the black church uh, um, who gave that solution to uh, General Sherman of uh, 40 acres. It's just, uh, I'm not with a mule no more, I'm with a, a, um, a Tesla or something that's an update and a way, like I said, to connect to Silicon Valley or to you know, influences of our time, because uh, it's time that this gets done. So thank you guys again. Shout out to California for being the first and the foremost. Uh, um, and um, much, lo much love to the room. I have one more person in the queue. Her name is Shanetta Davis. If you could press the continue button so I can um, move you over. Otherwise, we'll be moving forward. Okay, it looks like she um, is not responding, so. Um... All right, Trini, thank you so much. Well, thank you all uh, public commenters this morning. We have reached the allotted time for the public comment. If you were not able to provide a public comment, we invite you to attend public meetings or to submit comments or testimony via email at reparationstaskforce at oag.ca.gov. I will now turn the meeting back over to Chair Moore. Excuse me, Chair Moore, uh, Ms. Davis just, while, while she, she, uh, Aisha was making her comment, she just transferred over. Would you like to hear from her? I'm unmuted now. Thank yes, you, you all. Are. It is my honor to be able to speak with you all. I'm known for being short and sweet. And my comment is the designation of who we are attaining these resources, benefits for. Are we clear that it should be Black American descendants of chattel slavery and Jim Crow? Are we clear on who these resources and benefits are for. That's my question and my comment. Thank you for your comment. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Chair, that concludes public comment today. Thank you, Ms. Marie Walton, and thank you, Ms. Hurtado, for assisting the task force uh, with the public comment period. Now we will resume to agenda item number four, further consideration of the community engagement plan. And we are right on time um, and up to date with the agenda. And just um, as a timekeeping, timekeeping reminder, um, the, the, this discussion will last until 1045 a.m., then we will resume with agenda item number five, which is our first witness panel for the day. So um, I would like to, Vice Chair Brown, did you have a question that you wanted to pose to Professor Stoll or should we, um, you know, should I recognize Professor Stoll in the event that you wanted to continue on with your presentation? Vice Chair Brown, you are recognized in the event you have a question or a comment. My own comment is that I want to reiterate and make it patently clear. 
The concern is that in the concept, in the plan that was presented, for there not to be the vision of the involvement of basic organizations and institutions that have been a part of this struggle since the dove, dove flew out of Noah's Ark, if I may put it that way. I think we have to be very careful that we make sure that we're making optimum efforts to engage those persons who are in the trenches, who have the respect in the communities, and our statement of all in the family. And we want to be inclusive and not exclude anyone, but I don't think we need to at all be compromised in any way by intentionally or unintentionally excluding anybody in this thing that's a family affair. Thank you, Vice Chair Brown. And, and just to add to that, it, it's a comment that I have, and it leads to a question for uh, uh, Professor Stoll and uh, Member Grills, but I see that she had to step out. Um, now, my question is around the idea of reach, right? Like, have we defined what it means, what reach means? Um, you know, that, that's something that I'm, I'm grappling with um, presently. When we are, you know, attempting to identify anchor organizations uh, for reach, what does that really mean? Um, that's just something that, like I said, I'm grappling with. So, and my concern is that, and I think someone already illustrated this in, in a public comment, you know, there's so many Black Americans, um, you know, who aren't necessarily tied to um, organizations or uh, or to legacy organizations. Um, and so we have to, in my opinion, get creative as to who we're engaging in this process. And I agree that inclusiveness and inclusion should be a number one priority in terms of uh, selection criteria. But it's it's the reach part that I'm I'm not really understanding because I can see how utilizing reach as a criteria can be exclusionary, if that makes sense. Oh, it, can I share something about that? Uh, as I had mentioned in my presentation, it's very critical that the community engagement process be, walk, be occurring uh, lock and step with the communication strategy, right? So it's through the communication strategy using uh, radio, um, uh, uh, billboards. Um, I've been I've been getting a lot of um, education about how communications work, but that that would be a way to reach people who are not connected to some of these legacy organizations, as you mentioned. Um, and so it's not, and that communications entity would be part of the meetings of the anchor organizations so that we can figure out where are the holes, you know, where where is the, uh, what groups might be left out, you know, because they're not part of any kind of organized um, social justice or action campaign process. So it, communications is necessary along with whatever um, networks the anchor organizations can tap into. Yeah, I, I just want to reiterate that too from, uh, from the uh, Bunch Center's perspective as an academic unit who whose specialty and expertise is in um, gathering data and analyzing data. And I, but I do wanna share uh, Dr. Brown's concern and it, it's my own actual value too, uh, which uh, I'm not putting at center of, of the work, but I just wanna express, which is that this body has to be inclusive and you have to include as many voices um, and bodies as, as possible. And so the question is how best to do that. And from an academic perspective, uh, Dr. Grills is right, is that you need anchor organizations coupled with uh, uh, media and communication strategies that are able to link people who are at, potentially at the margins of participating to, to nudge them into participation, right? At Bunch, for similar kinds of activities, not at this scale, 
when you try to solicit information from individuals by either contacting them by phone or, or mail or email to participate, response rates are terribly low. They're usually around three to 6%, right? But when you couple that with uh, legitimate organizations that have trust and standing in a, in, a, in a community, coupled with communications, media strategies that let people know through public <clears throat> announcements that this is important and that here are your opportunities, those kind of interactions tend to bump up uh, participation in, in, in significant ways. Uh, because you just don't want the people whose voices we hear all the time who are at the front lines. You also wanna hear people who, who have opinions but are not able to express them. And that, that and sometimes we get interesting ideas in that way, just like the public forum with the 40 acres and a Tesla, right? <laughs> interesting ideas uh, in that way. So Bunch's position is always in this process to be supportive, but also to be exclusive and to be exhaustive and to be objective and to be able to, uh, to be able to express the broadest views uh, and inclusive views as, as as possible through this process, and that's that's the role that we tend we see ourselves as partners, as academic partners, as research partners, as as programmatic partners, with expertise to be able to collect this data and analyze it in a way that can be useful to the task force without any a priori assumptions or without any political opinion being expressed by by bunch. We've done this for for. Uh, since its inception in the 1960s. Um, and, and this is our comparative advantage and a, a, we hope an asset um, to the task force process and deliberations. Thank you. Person Moore. Yes, member uh, Scott Lewis, you are recognized. And then I will recognize member Joan Sawyer. Uh, member Scott Lewis, you are recognized. Thank you very much. Um, you know, so so to Professor Stoll and, and Professor Grills, I have a question around um, its issues of scope and scale, um, much much in line with some of the comments that have been made. Um, you know, even from the public comments, we we can see there is a great deal of concern around geographic representation, and so my my question is, well, how how does this plan accommodate or attend to the scope of the African American community um, within the state of California? In other words, there is a, you know, UCLA being located in Southern California. What is the plan for actually attending to the needs of Northern uh, Black uh, America, Northern Californians, and of course the communities who might, you know, be uh, represented in in Central um, Central California? Um, and so, in attending to that scope, what is exactly the kind of infrastructure of the Bond Center and its ability to accommodate, um, you know, that 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 growing that growing scope of representation as required, um, you know, you know, uh, orgs, you know, A through F needing to be replicated across these various geographies. Um, you know, LA has a very robust organizing uh, community. So does so does the Bay Area. Um, and so I would just love to have a, a clearer sense um, as to how how the geographies are are, are planned to be represented. Um, uh, across this program, which I, I, I do, in fact, you know, uh, like quite a lot. Thank you. So I could start. Um, thank you for that comment. In fact, it's because of the very point you're making that there, this idea of an anchor organization emerged around um, like who, what, what kind of entities would be best suited to make sure that we are covering, you know, California writ large and not focusing in on the usual suspects, Oakland, San Francisco, you know, Los Angeles, San Diego, et cetera. So one of the things, one of the reasons that we looked at this idea of an anchor organization was that they actually have uh, connections. They have, they're part of a network. They're leading a network that is statewide that's covering Northern, Central, Southern California, that's covering Inland Empire, that's covering, you know, the, the, the shoreline, if you will. Um, so you know, the, the, the balance of these anchor organizations needs to be such that they are able to touch and tap into all of the different, or as many of the different sectors of California as possible. 
And then also why there's this notion of a tier two is that there may be small pockets where there is important um, um, information that needs to be gleaned from those black communities. And so those tier two organizations would be the ones who are the boots on the ground, trusted, who, not, who have a constituency, but also know how to reach the broader community. They know what outlets, for example, are best suited to reach elder uh, African-Americans or younger age populations or folks who are part of you know, one of the systems, whether that's the, the, you know, the carceral system or the education system or the child welfare system, et cetera. So to your point, it's that very reason that you know, we are looking at these anchor and tier two organizations concept. Yes, and th let me also add a, a personal background note so that you get to know me more uh, since uh, many of you may not know me and I'm getting to know you and uh, I'm, I'm glad to be here. But you should also note that I was involved and in helped with the State of Black California uh, report almost 20 years ago with then uh, State Assembly member Karen Bass. And uh, one of the, one of the pieces of the project in developing the state of Black California, which was a report on the overall socioeconomic health conditions of Black Californians, was to have a public convening com component. And that public convening component was a process by which we were able to get public input from across the state, but mostly Black Californians around both their uh, ability to identify the problems that they wanted to see solved and to also express solutions. And, and so one of the problems that we had was exactly what Jovan Scott Lewis just talked about, which is this problem of representation. But there we were able to look at data and look at where the black densities were across the state. And you can see they've changed quite a bit in the last 20 years. We have a lot in the Empire, there's a lot in the Central Valley, uh, in Modesto, Fresno, right? There's all these other places that people wouldn't think would be, you know, um, central areas of, of, of black concentration, but they are. And so we were able to use that data also to see where it is that we, 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 we had to be outside of the quote, usual suspects that people just I, identified. So that would be part of the thrust too, to make sure that we understand where black Californians are living and also be able to uh, use both the anchor organizations of the way that Dr. Grills talked about, but importantly, the tier two organizations who are gonna be more nimble and are gonna be more, um, more connect, uh, I wouldn't say more connected, but they're going to also know where a lot of shifts and where uh, black residents are that would want to be able to be uh, contacted and, and participate in, in this process. It, it has to be a statewide process, this is a statewide task force, this is, a state, uh, this is about discussions around uh, a problem identification and policy discussion around uh, reparations for black Californians. There, there has to be, uh, there has to be the engagement the design of the of the convenings and the design of the of, of the potential survey to be able to collect information from Cal, Black Californians across the state. Could I, could I add an observation? Madam, um, Madam one, one moment, please. Uh, 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 Member Scott, Scott will before 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 um, I, I see, but I, I think you know. What might be helpful, and I would like to suggest, um, Dr. Grills, um, is that maybe we have some example or sample, you know, example um, organizations. My observation has been that a lot of these kinds of, you know, centers, programs, what have you, are actually quite regionally focused. And so I would, I would, I would want to actually see some some examples of some organizations that that have that statewide scope. Um, you know, and this is based upon my observation, um, you know, and if we can't, you know, you have these six areas, you know, if we accommodate what, what, what Dr. Amos Brown asked for, right, alongside some of the other areas like in health, education, housing, family, um, the public commenter, you know, made a statement about unaffiliated, that, that, that chairperson Moore also reiterated, the scope is actually quite, quite broad. And I think, you know, I would just I would feel more comfortable if I were able to see a few examples of organizations that had that statewide scope. And if we weren't, you know, especially in some of these key areas. Um, and if we weren't, I would just maybe suggest considering, you know, establishing, you know, another 
who could take up some of that regional regional focus, whether it's a Northern California partner um, or meaning someone alongside the Bun Center, right? Some organization alongside the Bun Center to kind of oversee um, the kind of breadth of the geography that that you know this really important strategy would would need to cover. And and, and I'll end there. Thank you. Yeah, that that's that's absolutely uh, fine. And I would also mention that um, so I think the task force members submitted suggestions. There was an Excel sheet that I received of organizations to consider. And so that's definitely um, in um, been shared with the um, Bunch Center. And we will, no one has been invited yet because we don't have a, an approved process. Um, so we didn't want to make invitations, like go get ahead of you know the process. So um, all the recommendations can be sent to Bunch Center um, and again, if there are organizations that you think, you know, are important to put in the, um, um, into the process of consideration, please do, you know, send that to, um, send that to me or send that to, um, uh, Professor Stoll, um, so that we do have a robust list from which the Bunch Center can do its due diligence in the final selection. Dr. Grills, can I also I, just state too, because I think I a, real, I real, real very. I have one of order, Madam Chair. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, can I, can Brown, I say this? Vice Chair Brown, Vice Chair Brown, you are recognized. Thank you, Madam Chair. Friends, we should be, and I hope so, that we are family. And family ought to be of a climate where people can share their true, transparent feelings. We can get off the dime on this matter by looking at number one, there was not an announcement made by this task force requesting proposals from wherever to do this community engagement. And this is no indictment of the Bunch Center at all. So I hope we will look at this matter as we will look at our shirt, our blouse having wrinkles in it. You hang with each other and you iron out the wrinkles and move on and put on the garment. This matter needs to be ironed out. And if there are other groups could have presented a proposal that did not have the opportunity, say it and do it. Or else we are not paragons of that principle of equality of opportunity and justice. Thank you, Vice Chair Brown, for that point of order. I'm sure uh, Member Grills and Professor Stowe could address that in time, but I did want to recognize Member Joan Sawyer. Please excuse me, uh, Member Joan Sawyer, you are now recognized. You are on mute. Oh. How do I unmute? You're good now. I'm good now? Yes. Okay. I want to make sure I, I uh, thank Dr. Grills for her work. Uh, it appears that she will not just leave this process as a member of this, this committee, knowing how we feel how we feel of uh, the outreach and making sure that everyone, all parts of California are involved in the outreach. Um, she will make sure that the UCLA Bunch Center um, is able to do their work. In some ways, it pains me as a proud USC alumni who represents USC in this district. I have to tell you, the Bunch Center 
is the best. It has been the best for decades when it comes to African-Americans and getting data for the California Legislative Black Caucus. Not only do you need a, a group that can do this research, that has not only the, the, the skills, the abilities, the capacity to get it done, but the part that Dr. Stoll said about impartiality to make sure we get the facts, not preconceived facts, but the facts from an academic point of view, because that's extremely important as we make recommendations to the legislature and to the governor so that whatever we decide we're going to do, whether it's a house and a Tesla, I don't, doesn't matter, or who gets what, who shot John, we're, we're talking about how to spend the money when we ain't got the money. But at the end of the day, we're going to have to present uh, almost an academic thesis on why we need reparations. Yes, we're okay with us. Talk to other black people. We got it. But you don't know the struggle that Dr. Weber had to go through just to create this task force, just to have this conversation by members of California who do not believe in what we do and what we want to do and what California needs to do and what this country needs to do. And there are black folks that actually believe that slave owners ought to get reparations too. So we're not all together on this either. And so I would suggest, since we have a member of our body on this, working with the Bunt Center, and again, it pains me to say, they are the best. And they've been the best for decades, as they said, since Karen Bass and others. The California Legislative Black Caucus wouldn't have fought for the Bunch Center to get funding every year. We've increased the funding because we knew we needed that group to speak for us to give the facts about what we need in California. If they weren't there, I don't know who we would have to go to. So I'm speaking not only on behalf of the center and what they do, but I'm also speaking that we need to have a group that when we bring this information back to the legislature, to the governor, to Republicans, to moderates, who may not share what we're going to propose, because we may be proposing a lot of money. When they see UCLA Bunt Center, it's going to have some gravitas in the legislature. It's going to, people are going to look up and have to respect what they say. So I understand the reticence about making sure we get to everyone. I'm a visual person. I would love to see the list of everyone they plan to reach. I don't need to see the list because I have unbelievable confidence that Dr. Grills will make sure that anyone that contacts anyone on this on this feed right now, and anyone that's listening right now, we will make sure that their 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 ideas are incorporated in the final recommendations. Let me say this again: recommendations that we make to the legislature and to the governor um, that we can get it funded. And uh, and I don't know if we needed a motion to approve the UCLA Bunch Center, but I will be making that right now. Uh, Madam Chair, I have another point of order. If it is a foregone conclusion that when this task force was established, that the Bunch Center was to be the entity that would do this work, fine, I have no problem with that. Let's be upfront, be candid. But there may be other groups based on their merit who felt, who feel that they should have been considered. And if you can lay the facts on the table that this is it, so may it be. But understand, 
that God's grace, God's genius is all around. That's what the system has done, acted in the past as if only certain sectors, only certain races had the brains, had the skills. So that's all Brother Amos is saying. Let us be transparent and upfront. And if that is it, so may it be. But don't give us the impression that we are about reparations, restoration, and justice. And then we become agents to the kinds of practices and principles that were exclusionary. I rest my case. I, I, would, I, make, the motion, if, I make the motion, Madam Chair, okay. that the Bunch Center would do this community engagement, but that the Bunch Center will be inclusive throughout the state and making sure that whatever public engagement we do will be will be the best one south of heaven north of hell okay so there's some okay i agree <laughs> all right so there's a motion on the floor from J vice chair brown uh, to approve the community engagement plan as presented with the notion that the Bunch Center will be as inclusive as possible in its efforts. Is there a second to the motion? I'll second it, but I just want to make a comment if that's appropriate. Okay, yes, it is appropriate. So uh, uh, it has been moved and seconded uh, to adopt the community engagement plan as presented with uh, the notion that the Bunch Center will be as inclusive as possible. Is there any discussion on this matter? Yeah, I, I just yeah. want to comment. Um, I hear all the concerns that have been voiced, but I'm going to echo what my colleague Reggie Jones Sawyer stated. I currently serve as the chair of the Legislative Black Caucus, and I'm the longest serving member uh, of the Black Caucus in the legislature. And in my almost 12 plus years of being there, the Bunch Center has been engaged in everything that we have done. And bringing on the Bunch Center is not exclusive to anyone else or any organization, but they were critical in helping Dr. Weber move this legislation forward to create this task force. So it's a lot of great organizations out there. And I think uh, Dr. Brown clearly stated, we're gonna make sure it's in inclusive. And I, I, I don't think that should be a fear of any of us that the list that you saw by Dr. Grills or the presentation is excluding anyone. It's just a framework of what we will do. And I too want the churches involved. I want civil rights organizations involved. So I think we're gonna get that with UCLA and I just leave it at that. It shouldn't be any fears that someone's gonna be excluded just because we've identified the Bunch Center to move forward with this work. Thank you, Member Bradford. I also have two questions, but in the interest of time, I'll truncate them, um, but I'll just say them for the matter of record. Um, I had a question around the budget, uh, you know, it, what information can be shared around that at this yeah, time? And then also um, in terms of the reach element, as I said before, like, will it be a subjective or quantitative um, um, criterion for determining reach, or would it would it be a confluence of of subjective and quantitative um, data? Are there any other questions from the members? Call for any other questions. Are okay. So I will now. Uh, hearing no further discussion, we will vote. The vote will be by re, uh, roll call, and I will now call on Parliamentary Johnson. We will then call on Ms. Belton to conduct the roll call vote. Ms. Uh, Parliamentary Johnson, you are recognized. Yes, thank you. Ms. De Ms. Belton, would you please call for the roll? <clears throat> call the roll for the vote. Thank you, Chair Moore and Parliamentary Johnson. Chair Moore, your vote, please. Aye. Chair Moore votes aye. Vice Chair Dr. Brown. Aye. Vice Chair Dr. Brown votes aye. Senator Stephen Bradford. Aye. Senator Stephen Bradford votes aye. 
Dr. Cheryl Grills. Aye. Dr. Cheryl Grills votes aye. Lisa Holder. Aye. Lisa Holder votes aye. Assemblymember Reginald Jones Sawyer. Aye. Assemblymember Reginald Jones Sawyer votes aye. Dr. Javon Scott Lewis. Aye. Dr. Javon Scott Lewis votes aye. Don Tamaki. Aye. Don Tamaki votes aye. Councilmember Monica Montgomery Step. Aye. Councilmember Monica Montgomery Step votes aye. Chair Moore, on this motion, there are nine aye votes, zero nay votes, and zero abstentions. Thank you, Ms. Belton. The vote was nine yeses and zero nays. The ayes have it and the motion carries. We will now move to agenda item five, which is our first witness panel of the task force. This witness panel will start promptly now until 12 p.m. The witness panel is, on a, is related to a primer on national reparations efforts and the international law framework for reparatory justice. At this time, I would like to remind each witness that their testimony is going to be recorded, live streamed, and will be available to the public. I will now introduce our esteemed speakers. Our first expert is Cam Howard. Cam Howard is a Chicago businessman and real estate investor. Mr. Howard has been a 16-year member of the National Coalition of Blacks for Reparations in America, or in COBRA, the longest running active organization championing the cause of reparations in the United States. Mr. Howard has led in COBRA as its national male co-chair since 2017. I'd also like to introduce Roy Brooks. Professor Brooks is the Warren Distinguished Professor of Law at the University of San Diego School of Law. Professor Brooks teaches and writes on civil rights and international human rights and has been involved with truth and reconciliation and reparative justice efforts around the world. So at this time, Cam Howard will have 15 minutes. Professor Brooks will then have a 15 minutes. And then we will take comments and questions from the task force for the remaining 30 minutes. And then we will conclude at noon, where we will then have a lunch break. So at this time, I would like to recognize Cam Howard. Welcome. You have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. I would like to begin by first thanking Governor Newsom for signing this legislation into law and creating the task force. Congratulations on this win. I'd like to thank the California General Assembly for moving this legislation to the governor's desk. And certainly I wanna thank Secretary of State Weber for introducing this legislation as a council, as a assembly person in the California <clears throat> legislature. Also thank the task force for inviting me here today. I come before this task force today as a black man in America, a descendant of Africans enslaved in the United States, a descendant of Africans targeted for Jim Crow apartheid violence and racial discrimination, and a person born shortly before the end of legal racial segregation who has witnessed and or endured all manner of continued injustices and harms directed at Blacks in America. I came into the reparations movement because of these injustices, both collective and personal. As a young man, age 27, I was unjustly accused, convicted, and incarcerated for a crime that never happened. Like many Black men who come in contact with the criminal justice systems in America, Evidence plays absolutely no part in the proceedings. As a result, I was sentenced to 20 years of incarceration, which I completed nine years and nine months as a result of the quote unquote good time I earned. It was that racial injustice that caused me to become an activist and leader while in prison among some of the most violent and dangerous men in the state of Illinois. After leaving prison, I spent nine years crafting a real estate investment business. Early success allowed me to go back to school and earn an MBA with a concentration in real estate. Free of economic hardship, I renewed my activism by throwing myself completely into the reparation struggle, something that I was introduced to while in prison by reading a book entitled Introduction to Black Studies by California's own Dr. Marlana Karinga. 
I joined in COBRA, the National Coalition of Blacks and Reparations in America in 2006, and fastly moved up the leadership ranks as a result of my intense thought contributions and redress actions. I currently serve as a national male co-chair in my third two-year term. And COMA was formed in 1987. Prior to becoming national male co-chair, I served as our legislative commission chair. In that role, I led the National African American Reparations Commission, NARC, in revising the federal legislation, HR 40, that became the Commission to Study and Develop Reparation Proposals for African Americans Act. The revision changed the bill from a pure study bill to a remedy bill. In addition to serving as a NARC commission, I, I was sought to sit as a, on the advisory committee of the African American Redress Network, a joint co collaboration with Howard University's Thurgood Marshall Law Center and Columbia University's Human Rights Center. I chair or serve as the director of several other national reparations formations, including First Repair, whose executive director is none other than Robin Ruth Simmons, former council member in Evanston, who will soon deliver the first local reparations initiative in this country. I've spoken in many major cities in America where there are large black populations, as well as internationally in South Africa, Ethiopia, and recently Guinea-Bissau. I gave testimony in April of this year before the Congress of the United States during the House of, Repre House of Representatives Judiciary Committee hearing HR 40, exploring the path to reparatory justice in America. I entitled my presentation then, Reparations is for Repair and the Need to Pass HR 40 Now. I would like to begin my remarks today by reminding or informing this task force of the September 2001 United Nations Human Rights Commission's hosting of a global conference in Durban, South Africa. That conference, the World Conference Against Racism, Xenophobia, and Related Intolerances, attracted 14,000 attendees. There were three major outcomes sought by the North and South American contingent of African descendants who attended that conference. One, that the transatlantic slave trade, slavery, and apartheid were crimes against humanity. Two, that there was an economic basis to those crimes. And three, that reparations were due. They were successful in the conference outcome document, the Durban Declaration and Program of Action. The international community of states declared that these actions were in fact crimes against humanity and should always have been so. Thus, there was, there was an economic basis to these crimes. In other words, that the wealth as well as poverty that we see in nations around the world and peoples around the world today is rooted in those crimes. And three, that the countries with African descendant populations have an obligation to engage in redress with and for those populations. The, the concluding outcome document of that conference and its declarations is the foundation, the very foundation of the current reparations movement in America and globally. This is worth repeating. The transatlantic slave trade and Jim Crow apartheid were and are crimes against humanity, which has no statute of limitations, meaning that if the entity that engaged in those crimes or its antecedent entity, the entity from which it grew from, still exists today, that entity is still, in fact, subject to the obligations of redress for the initial and ongoing crimes that it committed. They were enriched by these crimes, and the victims of these crimes were negatively impacted, meaning that they suffered injury. That impact continues in their descendants today, thus necessitating redress, not only for the crimes committed, but also for the continuing injury. So we have this international model for reparatory justice, crimes, injury, repair. This model was written in the revised version of HR 40. This legislation, HR 40 in Congress now has an unprecedented 193 co-sponsors and was successfully passed out of the House Judiciary Committee on April 14th of this year. We're urging Congress to schedule a floor vote in the House. And HR 40 also ha has a companion bill in the Senate, S40. The findings and purpose of California's AB 31 legislation, the bill that created this task force, charge you with your duties, will lift it word for word from HR 40. Thus, the above model, crimes, injury, repair, also lays the foundation and provides the direction for the work of this task force. Specifically, this task force is charged to uncover and document the crimes committed against African descendants in California. African descendants is an international term indicating persons whose ancestors were violently kidnapped from, African, from the African continent during the transatlantic slave trade and forced into enslavement in the Americas. 
Your legislation particularly addresses African descendants of the U.S. enslavement experience. In doing so, first, is the required understanding that there were international crimes committed in this country in California in three distinct periods. The first period was the period of the slave trade and the enslavement, 1619, 1865. You are asked to uncover those crimes committed in the state of California, or if you prefer using harms, you can use that language instead of crimes. Second period was a period of Jim Crow apartheid. Apartheid is an Afrikaans word that means separate development. It is backed by governmental policy and state committed sanctioned violence and terror. You are tasked with uncovering those crimes committed in the state of California. And the third period is post Jim Crow apartheid period, 1965 to the present. Police terror, predatory lending, mass incarceration, some of those crimes. As in the first two period, you're also tasked with the duty to uncover and document and catalog those harms. After dealing with the harms, we next come to injuries. A host of injuries have resulted in current living Black Californians because of the crimes of harms or harms committed during those three periods. The duty of the task force is to determine and quantify, when possible, the wide range of injury that exists among Black Californians. And COBRA offers assistance here. For more than 20 years, we've indicated to the government of the United States that there are five major injury areas that the legacy of those harms negatively play out in the lives of Black Americans today. Those five injury areas are, one, poverty and wealth, the economic reality of Black America that's revealed in less wealth, unemployment and underemployment, lack of access to capital for business development and, and et cetera. Two, the criminal justice system, historically and today has been used as a means of economic exploitation, dehumanization and domination. Three, education. Disproportionately skewing the resources to educate our children in ways that intentionally prohibited and prohibits self-sufficiency, American and global competitiveness, and esteemed cultural worth and value in our people. The fourth injury area, health. From inhumane experimentation to denial of historical trauma and its children, transgenerational transmission of trauma and transgenerational epigenetic inheritance, the health profile of Black America is one of immense crisis. And five, peoplehood. The devastating attack on African humanity, identity and culture, producing not only among whites, but also among some Blacks, a belief system that confers an immense value on whiteness while simultaneously, simultaneously, excuse me, while simultaneously criminalizing and, viol and violently devaluing Blackness. This resulting in anti-Black behavior by whites, and retarding of uh, potential in Black people. These injury areas have to be examined by this task force. Finally, then, there's repair. Uncovering and identifying the harms, quantifying and illuminating the, the injury naturally leads to reparatory mechanisms to redress those injuries. Here, written in AB, AB 3121, is your mandate to propose remedies in alignment with international norms of full reparations, which in COBRA calls for repair, as well as special measures. Full reparations enshrined in international law has as its object to, quote, wipe away all consequences, unquote, of the crimes or harms. The framework for achieving that challenge consists, consists of five components. Component one, cessation, assurances and guarantees of non-repetition. A state responsible for wrongfully injuring a people is under an obligation to A, cease the act if it's continuing, and B, offer appropriate assurances and guarantees of non-repetition. The second component is restitution and repatriation. Here one is charged to reestablish the situation which existed before the wrongful act was committed, to restore the victim to the original situation before gross violations of international law occurred. How includes restoration of freedom, recognition of humanity, identity, culture, repatriation, livelihood, and wealth. Three, compensation. The injuring state is obligated to compensate for the damage if damages is not made good by restitution. Compensation is any financially accessible damage suffered. Proper compensation is such that it's appropriate and proportional to the gravity of the violation and circumstances. The fourth component, satisfaction, as a means of reparations for moral damage, such as emotional injury, mental suffering, 
and injury to reparation. And finally, five, rehabilitation. Rehabilitation consists of mind, body, emotional, and spiritual healing. 